I'm getting a. All right. So we're going to try this again. Okay. Apologies. I just can't do anything right. All right. So it's a variation of the trash defense to the, uh, or trash variation of the, of the French defense. But here White commits a very serious error. I believe normal move is to bring one of these knights up here. And White plays bishop b5, which is not good at all. And black fails to take advantage of it. Now, let's let's decide why this is not a good move. <clears throat> well, part of it has to do with what we call the French bishop. The French bishop is on c8. That's just his nickname. Uh, playing the French defense, it's the French bishop that just doesn't have a lot of activity. One of the reasons it doesn't have a lot, a lot of activity is partly because of this little pawn chain right here, and then again, this pawn on b7. You know, there's a lot of pawns in the vicinity of that bishop. It doesn't have a whole lot of scope. You know, black can play similar structures like the Karo Khan, and if it's an advanced variation, that bishop could be out in f5 where it's going to do some things. You know, a whole other, another right thing. <clears throat> so, tactically, this is a mistake, and black failed to take advantage of it. So, the correct move here is to take with the pawn. Now, white has a, a little dilemma here. Uh, if he takes back with his pawn, he just drops a, drops a pawn. And <coughs> queen here is met by this. And then black is going to play bishop e3. And white's going to have a lot of fun trying to get himself castled here. Okay. Going to have to maybe try for some, you know, anytime g4 comes in, that's just horrible. Allows a knight to drop in here or, or a queen check. You know, white's going to maybe have to play, let's get rid of the arrows. Uh, my white might have to play to occupy d4, uh, just in order to be able to castle. <laughs> so, you know, this, and not only that, black is a pawn ahead. So white doesn't, white doesn't have anything here. So what this means is, after pawn takes, white needs to take this right here and right now. And now he can take back, and, and it is le now it is leisure. He can play c5 when he's ready. And one one thing Black is going to get is a protected pass pawn on d5. Okay, and and Black could even play bishop a6 here, and this might mean that White will have to develop his knight to e2 in order to be able to safely castle it. Where would you rather have your knight on e2 or f3? So the drawback for black is what, you know, black missed his chance here to get somewhere. He played a6. <clears throat> and the difference is, after, you know, after either a6 or pawn takes, no matter which move you make, this this is going to, needs to be white's next move. So the timing was off. Uh, and now white takes. And the difference between this position and the other is, Black is, has traded uh, uh, the move a6 for capturing on d4, and that gives white an, an extra tempo to kind of catch up. And now white doesn't have to take with his pawn, allowing black to get c5 in, forcing a pass pawn. Okay, and did I mention this pawn is in the way of the French bishop? You know, it's, you're going to have to stop and move it again you know, if you want to get the bishop here. So now I can take back this way, and uh, and uh, uh, you know this bishop is, is back to being a French bishop again. Now I'm going to show one other idea White could have done here uh, is playing knight here. Now say we take and take and come here. Uh, White just ignores what Black is doing, and you know tries to start his own attack. Uh, let's see. Let's let's do this. Do this move first. Now here. Now we have an attack down here, and we have an attack here. And if Black castles, uh, you know this this move looks to be good for uh, White. Threatens mate, threatens the bishop. May have to give up a piece here. 
and now black has six to two, six pawns to two, uh, but uh, <clears throat> two of them are doubled, and white has a two to one on the other side and an extra piece. So white should should win this. Although it's gonna you know it's gonna require some work as well the pawns that black has and and the two bishops, but this bishop here remains kind of awkward, and. Uh, And, you know, and another idea for, for, for white is to take this. And instead of playing queen g4, uh, play check. Check. That forces this, and after queen h6, white has some new threats. Black cannot castle. White wants to chase that rook away and steal one pawn and then maybe steal the other with check. So, anyway, you know, black missed a chance to get an advantage here. Now he does get c5 in. But, you know, we still have, we have this French bishop. Now, black can eventually force a pass pawn with here, but it won't be a protected pass pawn. Okay, let's go forward. Oops. Hey. I pushed the wrong button Check. every now and then, so we got to go back 67. So black is going to win this, meaning white misplayed it, but that happens. Okay. Bishop e7. Let me make sure I still have connection. Yeah, I still have connection. Okay. And both sides get castled. So the game's probably about even. Uh, you know, black well, black has the two bishops, but can he get them activated? Okay, so undermining the center, but at the same time, uh, creating a weakness here. Now... Okay, so now we're going to set up a potential break here later. You know, both sides, queens, bishops are just bad pieces. So they're both developing. Restrain this pawn a little bit. Let's see, there's three attackers, three defenders, so it's safe. Now it looks like uh, Black's trying the idea I was talking about. Let's get that bishop there. That's what it looks like. Yep, there it is. And we have a nice square we can put it. We might even transfer it over here and tell White, well, if you want to, if you want that bishop back, I'll, I'll take a, a nice healthy pass pawn. But at the same time, you know, we don't have to do that. That's a very nice piece to, to have on the board. Okay, so let's go forward. Okay, attacks a pawn, protects. There he took the square. Now this, this weakens this square. I, I, I don't know. You know, these, all three of these pawns look kind of weak now. So this is good. I'm starting to win a pawn. And I guess he takes it. Yep. And black has given back the, uh, uh, the bishop for knight, but his bishop is good. Uh, white's, white has, what, seven pawns? Six of them are on, on the color of his bishop. Uh, black has uh, seven pawns, only three of them are on the color of his bishop. So, uh, you know, black is a pawn ahead and looking pretty good and ready to activate on the, uh, on the B file. Check. Okay, um, now obviously, ooh, this might be trouble uh, takes. Takes. I guess you have to come back here, but this queen got real active. Check. Okay. You have to, no, no, you don't have to retreat. You can retreat with the bishop, but then you're pinned. So maybe you should retreat the bishop, even though it's pinned, because I think if you put the rook in, and that's the natural instinctful move, well, you could also go there. But it, it, I, I'm saying natural instinct is you're attacking me, I'll attack you. You know, this, this pawn could be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, could be, you know, just queen back here, and white might be hard pressed to uh, to save that pawn. So it comes up here. So now he can, if he saves this pawn here, he loses this one. So it looks like black is doing pretty well. He has that. Okay. Now we've got that pressure on e4.
Okay. And this is good. Let's just centralize. If you want to take my queen, I'm going to get a protected pass pawn. We just want a part of that. So black trades. So uh, black clearly has the advantage here. Uh, at some top point, he can uncover an attack on this. So maybe a good move here would be a4. Let's put this pawn on a square that uh, White's bishop can't attack it. Let's fix that pawn on a3 on a square where our bishop can attack it. Let's see what black does. Okay, well, black could play here, or white could, but well, let's see. If white plays here, we just go behind it. And um, if you come over this way, he takes it. So this, this move seems to work. Uh, but there's one, there's one drawback with this so quickly. What is that? That's a good question. It's something you always want to think about when you get an, get an end game with rooks. The moment that white ta or black takes that pawn on a four, uh, black may seize or white may seize the b file. Okay, so let's let's just imagine. Let me get rid of the arrows. Okay, let's just imagine that it's Black's play, and he takes here, okay? Let's just imagine that for a moment. White has rook b2 getting on the b file. Now, I realize that hangs this pawn here, okay? But it's White's move. So let's just, for the sake of argument, let's go here. And now let's assume that Black takes, and suddenly... Uh, White is, has activated his rook. Now, black is two pawns ahead, but white has a little glimmer of hope here because he's got he's got his rook active. And, you know, we want our rooks behind our pawns, not in front of them. The rule, get your rooks behind pawns. Your pawns, your opponent's pawns. And for what it's worth, white has a threat of rook here. Uh, which seems to win a piece. So maybe black needs to uh, defend that like this, but then suddenly uh, white has got his rook activated. And, you know, now we can defend this. And, you know, and black can say, oh, I'm going to advance this pawn, but uh, it gets a little crowded down there. You know, that black's rook uh, can't really... Uh, vacate the the file he can get as far as a2 but then his rook is stuck on a1 so you know granted this is still in in uh, black's favor but but white has erected a little bit of a stubborn defense now you know magnus carlson will sit here and pick anybody clean okay with black we're mere mortals you know it's not it's not as easy for us so you know this is the kind of position white wants to strive for and it's also the position that black wants to avoid. So let's let's come back here a second, and you know, as I try to help you uh, understand chess a little bit, does it really? Do we have to win this pawn right now? I mean, I gave up a line where I showed a line where white gave it up. So do we have to win that pawn right now? No, we don't. We have control of the B file. Let's play this. Okay, again, as, as I said, the reason I want to play this move is, number one, I'm stopping white from playing this. Whoops. And, um, you know, if white can get that pawn to a4, uh, it's safe, or safer than, you know, from this bishop. Uh, black may still be able to get in there behind it and win it, but we already saw that, that white gets the b file. So here we're going to play a4, and we're going to say, I don't want you on the b-file. And if you really want to be on the b-file, we're going to trade rooks. So uh, white tries knight d3. And now we kick that, and white doesn't have time for rook b2 because this rook is protected. So let's see, maybe this comes over here. Oh, we got a little bit of a mess here. But I'm not worried about that. Uh, you know, I'll just play this. 
Now, the A4 pawn is safe. The B file is closed. White can't uh, get on there. That's what he wants to do, right? Uh, so white, if white wants on the B file, he has to stop and move this knight. And that looks like the only safe square. Now let's just go take it. And I'm keeping you out of the B file. Uh, and if the rook comes over here, uh, let's see. Mm, well, you know, one thing we have, we have this we have this rook ideally posted on a8. We have the rook behind the pawn. Let's remember the rule. You want your rooks behind pawns, your pawns and your opponent's pawns. Okay, uh, this is still a good bishop. Uh, we can try to trade it. Let's see. Let's, or we can keep it on the board. Let's trade it. And now white doesn't have to trade, but we're, we're trying to generate something here. Now, see, we have the rook behind the pawn. And white doesn't have time to activate his rook because that pawn just runs. And, you know, black has up healthy two pawns and, and white had no play. So, you know, a4, A4 is a nice positional move. So he played rook b3, and uh, white defended. He didn't. Uh, he's trying to hold on to the pawn. Now comes c4, and, and, the pawn, and it seems like there's going to be a goner. But white wants to try to find a way to get on the b file. Maybe it's impossible. So, you know, this, this could work for black. I'm just offering a different uh, scenario. Now we got to be careful here. The rook's under attack. And he's defending the bishop. So did white win the exchange here? Check. He has no, he has his wish in his hook. Okay, this is the saving move. Or is it? No, we can still take this. We're on the rook. And now we save the bishop. Hmm. Okay, I guess the this makes sense. The idea is uh, if you get two pawns to the sixth rank, they're unstoppable. So this is a very nice move. So, you know, Black's plan is working. But, uh, yeah, see those, those pawns go through now. They can't stop them. See, look at that. Boom. Okay, game, game over. Check. And... Check. Uh, White decided that was enough. It looks to be a mate here pretty quick. King up. Check. check. And there's your check mate. Check mate. Right? Okay. So let's back this up. Uh, what I was showing was that uh, um, wait, went too far. What I was showing was that uh, you want to, you know, you want activity. You know, now if you know, black could still play a four, but taking might be premature. So we can only play the moves we play against against what our opponent throws against us. Uh, you know, if, if you know, I'm throwing moves at you that I, I believe are 2,200 uh, strength moves. You know, that's my ability. In some cases, over a sequence, I can throw 24, 2,500 moves. Uh, you know, like if I've proven several times, uh, many times, a lot of you, are, you're going to, 20% 20, 20 of your moves, or maybe even 30% of your moves, are going to be grandmaster moves. Okay, it's just <laughs> trying to get the other remaining 60 to 80% of the moves to be somewhat close to so that we can uh, get better at chess. But we can get better at chess. But here, you know, the simple idea is that uh, White's trying to play this to get his rook active. See, like I say, now rook, rook here creates a threat. The threat, you know, if Black's not careful... You know, he bungles a piece here. Okay. So, it, so 
Uh, the knight doesn't have really good square. You know, those are all gone. We just lose it. We don't want to put it here necessarily. I'm just taking it out of play. So I was looking at bringing the king over. And now white gets the rook behind the pawn. Following the rule I was discussing, you want your rooks behind pawns. Your pawns and your opponent's pawns. And, you know, uh, we just protect the bishop here. So it's still in Black's favor. Magnus Carlsen probably shows a way to win this. Uh, we have a little more difficulty, okay? Uh, of course, if uh, if we're playing uh, white here, uh, we have plenty of difficulty ahead. But but you know, if Black doesn't play accurately, uh, suddenly white can get back in this game in a hurry. Uh, you know. Maybe this pawn advances too far and becomes lost. Then we have uh, a great deal of technicality and difficulties winning this. It was a fine game by Black, but you know we're not asking you guys to play like grandmasters. We're just asking you to learn things. So I'm kind of going to switch the focus slightly for a, <coughs> a moment. I'm going to take a very quick break. Uh, let me post some links here. I post these every lesson or every session I come on. I haven't come on because my voice is much, because my voice has just been shattered. So I'm, I'm trying to speak uh, below what I normally would. And uh, I may have permanent damage, I may not, but, uh, but I'm, I'm experimenting, trying to get it better, trying to heal it. So I got five links up here. Okay, what do we got? Okay, we've got my website. We'll come back to that. Uh, my Twitch channel. Well, you found it. You're here. So please subscribe. And then the next one, uh, join. This is my video lessons group. I have uh, one of the largest groups on chess.com, over 17,500 members. The group is almost seven years old. And uh, we, uh, we run a lot of what, we, what I call correspondence team matches. Chess.com came up with a new name. They call them uh, daily matches. Ugh. A bone, I'll have a bone to pick with them. The, you, know, you know, the old days uh, of chess, before the internet came along, we played what we call correspondence chess. In other words, chess by mail. Instead of sending a letter, you would just send a postcard. Postcard costs less money. Okay? And games would last, oh, uh, well, maybe a year if you played somebody domestically. Yeah, you might get it over in five months if you're lucky. If you're playing somebody in Europe, nine months to two years. If they're in Eastern Europe, might go three or four years. And some people look at that and say, "Oh my God, how could you, uh, how could you play like that?" Well, you know, it's just the way it was back then. You know, two hundred years ago, uh, you know, gold had not been discovered in in California. It was another it would take another thirty years. Uh, so, one hundred seventy years ago, there was a gold rush. And the center of population uh, at that time was, you know, East Coast. So if you wanted to go go get gold, you had three ways to go. You know, now you just hop on a plane, right? Okay, but your three ways, you could take a covered wagon across uh, the United States. That took a few months. You could take a boat from, like, Boston, although Boston Harbor, all the way down to uh, uh, the tip of South America and come back up to uh, San Francisco and then go inland, or you could uh, go half that distance, go down to the Isthmus of Panama, where it's only about 25 miles across the uh, uh, what's now the country of Panama. They didn't have the canal back then. That would, you know, that wasn't around until the turn of the century that they got that going. Something like Teddy Roosevelt did. And you'd cross by land there and then catch a shorter boat ride. So, you know, I'm, you know, I go into detail sometimes, but, you know, it's all relative. So, you know, my, the correspondence chess, they, they had a vote, what do we call it? They used to call it turn-based chess. I don't know where they got with that. Well, we all understand what correspondence chess is, or I hope. But correspondence chess changed. It changed in a lot of ways. And the Internet's the, the chief uh, changer. Now, I remember, I'm um, thinking about 1990, they had a tournament they held by fax. 
you know, do we even still use fax machines, you know, FAX? Uh, but you see the difference with whether it's fax or on the internet, there's no post office. Its transmission is instant. And, uh, you know, if I was playing, I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada, if I was playing a correspondence game by card with somebody in Los Angeles, it's going to take two days just to get the move to them. And depending if there's a Sunday or holiday, it might take three or four. Okay. And then how quick can he reply? If he's home when he gets his card and wants to play quickly, he can put it in the mail. I used to do that all the time. I was, I had funny work hours so I could get my mail and, and, uh, I, I knew a place I could drop my letter off at midnight. My, my mail off at midnight would still go out with today's postmark. That's a trick called sectional center. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But, you know, correspondence has by, by, by postcard is virtually dead now. Um, the main organization is uh, ICCF, International Correspondent Chess Federation, and they've been running world championships there since, I think, the 50s. An Australian Pur Purdy, CJS Purdy, his peak, he was probably 23, 2400 over the board. He won the first one. American Hans Berliner won the third one. Uh, but, but, you know, one thing they discovered about correspondent chess was uh, you, you you know you have time you have time to analyze, and you know some of the best players in history have weaned themselves on correspondence chess. The one that comes to mind is uh, Paul Carey's, uh, the Estonian uh, grandmaster, who's one of the best players in the world. Uh, world War II uh, cost him a chance at a, a title match. Uh, anyway, so I'll another story there, but. 1931, when he was still just a teen, young teen, he played a lot of correspondence games. And so, what do you get? What do you get out of correspondence games? Well, you know, we're, uh, what what I've been doing already is is something out of correspondence games. Okay, uh, and uh, I want to keep this discussion going. I'll take a quick break. Uh, see, let's uh, here. I'm just going to set up a position. Not a great position, but I want to uh, do it this way. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll just make it a two mover. Uh, white to play and win. Well, the win is. You know, you want to work on it. Uh, you want to try it yourself. Uh, let's, uh, you know, White has just given up his queen. And many pe many people have fallen into this. One of my students fell into this within the last year in a slightly different position. So I'm gonna, I mentioned I need to take a break. Let me give you this real simple position, White to play and win. White has just sacrificed his queen. Okay, so... <clears throat> come back here in a couple minutes.
Okay, so, you know, I gave you a little puzzle here while I was gone. Uh, you know, white to play win-win. Uh, we just check. check and checkmate. Checkmate. This is uh, legal's mate. It's known as legal. It's spelled just like uh, uh, it sounds. I think it's pronounced legal, French name. I learned this when I was uh, about 11 years old reading chess books. So uh, what I did was I gave you a simple two mover. Uh, now, uh, the, if you were with me from the, the last game I analyzed during another game, you know, we're, I'm just looking at ideas variations. We're studying chess. Now, let's let's back this up a little bit, and we'll talk about this in relative terms, because what I'm going to teach you here is why, now, probably in this position, this is no good. I just wanted to set up a two-move mate. So, for the purists out there, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this here, and now, uh, so we have the same, same idea, okay? Uh, Check. And, and we deliver the mate, okay? Check mate. Right? So this way there was no knight takes on e5. I forgot about that little nuance. So, you know, we get a position like this, and say we're playing uh, what they call bullet chess, one-minute chess, you know, my God, okay? <laughs> well, Nakamura would, uh, who's probably the best bullet chess player in history, uh, who's not a computer, uh, would... would would know this move in a heartbeat, and you know Black to play has has ju just lost a pawn. He he needs to take the knight. But you know if you're playing bullet chess, uh, unless you knew this theme, you know would you find knight takes e5? Now if you played blitz chess, a five minute game, would you find knight takes e5? Well, you might. You might. Why not? It depends on your strength. It also depends. If, uh, if you've seen this before and then made a pattern recognition, oh, yeah, I remember this. But, you know, now you're, say, you're playing in a tournament. That, uh, you go to a weekend tournament, and they're playing 40 moves in two hours or something like that. You, know, you take 10, 15 minutes here, and, you know, if you needed to, and then eventually, hey, it dawned on you. But in correspondence chess, uh, you know, they, they, you have an average, of, uh, an average of three moves, uh, three days for a move. Like they play a time control with 10 and 30. At least that's what ICCF used to do. I don't know what they do now. Um, so if you answer the move the same day, and zero time counts against you. And you can accumulate time. Then when your positions start getting tough, you can spend more time. But, you know, the key to success at correspondence chess, and, and it's a very, very valuable tool. Uh, if you look at my video lesson one, it's... My YouTube channel is there. I talk about how correspondence chess helped me, uh, and uh, and I'll allude to it a little bit here. And then I'm going to be showing some correspondence games, uh, and 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 discuss how one particular player is improving his chess a lot by uh, taking my advice on how to uh, uh, treat this. And you know, if you understand the history of correspondence chess, you'll understand how you can really take advantage of this. And that's what's good about my video lessons group, because we run a lot of team matches, and I'm going to get to that uh, as I explain this more. But, you know, to succeed at, at correspondence chess, you need to analyze the position. And, you know, back in, in those days, like uh, before we had uh, the Internet where we could uh, uh, transmit a move instantly, uh, we had, you know, we had to rely on the post office, and again, depending on where your opponent lived, there, there would be a uh, uh, cons considerable time between moves. And you know, if you got, you, you know, you, you you play maybe a dozen games, and you usually have something to look at every day. Okay, if you get too many games going, you go nuts. And you know, there are people now without any transmission time. There are some people that carry hundreds of games going. Oh my God. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they don't have any time to play. Anyway, let's, let's come back to what we're, what I want to talk about. But, you know, in the old days, you know, the good players understood that you would take hours on a move. Hans Berliner, uh, he was about a 2450 player who participated in three U.S. championships during the uh, reign of Bobby Fischer, uh, late 50s, early 60s. And one of me finished in the top third, one in the middle, and one in the bottom third. 
uh, he gave up over the board chess and switched to correspondence chess. And uh, he qualified for the finals. It was a quicker path back then. Uh, they qualified for the finals, and he won. He won the finals by a margin no one's come close to matching. Uh, he recently passed away within the last two years, uh, but uh, he was one of the greatest uh, correspondence chess players in history. And you know, he was talking about correspondence chess. You need to take three hours a move. And you know, when I was playing it, I, I wasn't taking three hours a move. Sometimes I was taking five. 10, 15, 20, you know, get myself in a mess, even though I was trying to take time, maybe I had too many games or I just make a overlook something and I had to put in a lot of work. But, you know, one of the ideas uh, is the time factor. You have time to, to play accurately. So, you know, there were plenty of publications uh, talking about how to play correspondence chess. You know, in Germany, they published a, a magazine called Fernschock. I'm pretty sure it's still published today. Some articles are in German, some are in English. Um, you know, in the United States, there's uh, Correspondent Chess League of America. They have their chess correspondence publication. comes out every two months. I think uh, one is folding American Postal Chess Tournaments. It may have already folded. Uh, the, uh, the owners are probably in their 80s now and just decided that they weren't going to sell it. They are going to just let the thing play out all their tournaments and close it down. But you know these were there are plenty of articles written by correspondence players. So let's 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 look at some of the advantages of what you what you could do in correspondence chess. Well, you're allowed to use books. You know, and I don't think people are reading books like they used to. Oh, it's a chess book. Well, here's one I had up yesterday. It's on knight endings. You know, just endings with knights and pawns. Okay, you want an opening book while they're around here somewhere. Uh, I could probably try and pick a different one than I did last time here. Okay, here's one. French defense to rash variation. That was the uh, uh, variation of the last game. You know, this is just one book. 96 pages of games and notes and suggestions and comments. You know, people just don't read books anymore. But you're allowed to use books. You're allowed to use databases. That's the wonderful thing. Database, you know, 8 million games on chess base or whatever number they're at right now. Uh, if you put type in a position and search, it'll bring up all the games that reach that position. And you can just sit there and play through them to your heart's content. But, you know, uh, you're allowed to use all that stuff. Uh, it, you know, and, you know, one of the reasons I made sure I had these endgame books, and I have, there's a, this is an eight-volume set, uh, just, just nine endings and all the other uh, simple end games. One of the reasons I had these was to use in reference when I got these positions in, in a correspondence game, was to find, I wouldn't find my exact position necessarily, but I'd find the guidelines for, uh, you know, what I had, and, and I could learn, learn, learn the methods of how to play them correctly. You know, you can, uh, so correspondence chess is a great way to learn as you play. So what's wrong with getting uh, a perfect uh, position after 15 moves of theory? Well, it's rather harder to win from, but but hey, if you've got a great position, you're 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 uh, you're off to a good start. Now, but you see the thing that happened though that ki that really hurt correspondence chess the way it's played now is when the internet came along and 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 people started playing correspondence chess. Uh, it was a new it was new to them, and they didn't know about all these publications I mentioned. Uh, it was just a new way to play chess. So a lot of people, even today, they they treat they look at this as as a substitute for an over the board game. Now, if I want to play, say I want to play a thirty minute game on on ICC or Chess dot com. Well, I'm on ICC right now. I mean, I just uh, uh, would go into here. You see it here. Uh, seek a game. Uh, you know, say I want a 30 minute, I just push this and it'll, it'll find me a game. If I want a 15 minute game, boom, I've got it. One minute game, three minute game, whatever. I don't want to play a game, but, but I'm just saying it's that easy to get a game. And, uh, uh, so, <clears throat> you know, and I play the game under those parameters. Well, you know, that's one way they can get a game too, but they get this correspondence game and, and, and they think, oh, 
If my opponent's online, I might be able to crank out 12, 15 moves today if he'll stay with me. And if he goes home uh, or, or, or goes offline, well, tomorrow, we, maybe we'll finish tomorrow. And maybe we'll, it might take all week, but I'll have, I'll have some fun. Well, they're missing the whole chance to do everything. And, and trust me, I've analyzed countless correspondence games. People are not playing book. They're, they're, they're not consulting databases. Now, that's not everybody. But it's a substantial portion. They just don't don't understand how to do it. The other thing, like I say, they're they're in a hurry to play. They will make their move. These people that carry hundreds of games, they're looking at the position and playing a move. And I've run into some of those people. It's like they're playing blitz chess and I'm playing tournament chess, and they can play a good blitz game, but uh, the mistakes will come and I will I will destroy them. So, yeah. You know, so what does correspondence chess do? It gives you a chance to play the opening perfectly. And you learn the opening, you go to a tournament, you can use that opening. I mean, you know, when I was playing heavily correspondence chess, uh, as white, I opened with C4. And I learned what to do against the, the most common replies. C5, E5, Knight F6, E6, G6, you know, and, and others. I ran all these and I learned the systems. As, as black, I would play the Nimzovich defense. And, and I learned what to do against knight f3, against knight c3, against d4, and so forth on down the line. And against uh, d4, I played the Chagorin defense to the queen's gamut. I wanted to learn something different. And and I and then I played countless games on uh, Blitz Chess when the internet came along. You know, I was heavily, heavily into correspondence chess in 1986. Uh, I, I, I won, I signed up for, let me think. Seven master class sections, seven man sections. You had to win two to advance, and I won four. So I had two qualifications in the world championship cycle. And I didn't go any farther past, you know, once I got into the what they call the semifinals or quarterfinals. I didn't go any further, but I got in there twice. And I, because of my activity, I was selected to play in uh, team tournament, Pacific Area team tournament number three, which was United States. Canada, Mexico, I think Colombia, uh, Peru, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And do we play Japan? I don't think we did. But anyway, uh, uh, I didn't do particularly great, but the team did well, and we, you know, we won first place. I think I had f five points out of eight. I think I had uh, four wins, two losses, and two draws on on board six. Won a gold medal for Team USA, okay? Uh, the equivalent of, of an Olympic or, or some of the Pan Am games that they have in chess, you know. I, I won that. So I have the letter, I have the medal, um, kaboom. But, you know, I took my time and I learned the openings. Then when I go play these in a tournament, I would, I would know what to do. So it's a great way to study. See, one of the things I, you know, I talk about in the uh, my video lesson one, you know, say say you're, you're preparing for a tournament. And you want to play the Sicilian defense. So you spend 20 hours studying all your lines of the Sicilian defense. Then you go to the tournament. And, you know, say you're black six rounds, you're black three times. You run into D4 or Knight F3 or C4. You never run into E4. Well, you wasted your study time. Okay. <laughs> so we're studying while we're going. You're learning as you're going. And and then you get a chance to, to, to play in your middle game accordingly. So, like I say, what happens today is is people aren't uh, taking correspondence chess seriously. Now, my my video lessons group, uh, we play other clubs, uh, and some of these clubs they build them to win team matches. Now, how do they do that? Well, they only invite or accept players into their club that have a nice high rating. Okay, so we get into a match and and maybe at eighty boards, and uh, maybe we will be higher rated on a few of them, but the rest of them, you know, we're giving up 50 to 200 points, rating points, and we get clobbered. Uh, I think that the, the team match, we 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 won 39% of our matches. At one time we had it up to 40, but it slipped back down. And, you know, but what's the advantage? Well, you're playing somebody stronger. And you're learning, you learn when you play somebody stronger, Okay. You don't, you know, you play somebody low, you're not learning anything except how to win a winning game. That's what you're learning. You're getting target practice how to win a, win game, uh, win a winning, winning game. That's what you get. <clears throat> okay. 
but you see, my my belief is so many pay, people they don't play the opening well. They uh, um, in correspondence chess, they uh, if you if you will use theory, you'll get a great position, and if you take your time, there's a good chance they won't. What's going to happen? You're going to win probably going to win a lot more games. Now, one thing I've talked about repeatedly, what happens when you win a lot of games? Well, your rating goes up. Duh. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, but when your rating goes up, you get to play stronger players, the players you can learn something from. You know, you, you like to get upset. You like to beat strong players. Correspondent, correspondent chess on my team is a great way. It's right there. There's the link. Boom. If you don't have the account at chess.com, get one. It's easy. You <laughs> should take our email in a few minutes of your time. So anyway, uh, I'm going to give some ex be going over some correspondence games from someone that's having some success. Uh, let's see. Let's come back to the links. YouTube. There's my play. Uh, my my uh, playlists. All the YouTube videos I put. All that stuff's free. When I broadcast here, this is free. Okay. Uh, now a couple other places you want to play slow chess. Team forty five forty five league dot org. These are played on the Internet Chess Club, the site that uh, I am on right now. 45 minutes to start. Every time you move, you get a 45-second increment added. Uh, they run in the uh, several sections under 2,000, under 1,800, under 1,600, etc. Uh, you, uh, they run four tournaments a year. They have about, uh, I don't know, six rounds, eight rounds preliminary. Then they go into playoffs. So you might, if you get into playoffs, you know, you, you get to play more and you can win free months on your membership because ICC does charge you. Okay, uh, and their link to join ICC is right there at www.chessclub.com. Now I use uh, Blitz and I like it better. Most people use Day. Sure, I don't like it. I'm old school on some things. <clears throat> okay, so with all this, you know, all these opportunities to get better at chess. That's you know, that's what I teach. I I I, I show you ways. Now those that want more personal instruction. They take lessons with me. Uh, they pay me to analyze their games. So, like going back to my website, chesscoachbill.com is an easy thing. For forty nine ninety five a month, you get to always have an ongoing correspondence game with me, and I comment on every move, give you some feedback, judge your play. Uh, I give you homework every week, so you can you're building your own chess book, and the, I have methods that I that I I do. Uh, stress that'll help you. I, I bring up these methods when I'm analyzing games uh, and I help, uh, my homework reinforces what you need to do to win win games. And uh, what else do you get? Oh, uh, I said you get better by playing stronger players. You know, some of the competing organizations, they run simuls, like they'll have a master come every Saturday and say 10, 10 a.m., whatever, Eastern time, Pacific time, whatever. Uh, you have to be there to, in order to play them. Well, you know, it can be a little inconvenient for some people, you know, especially like a Sunday morning, maybe you're in church, okay? Um, so I've decided, I, well, I'll still give simuls, but I've, I have about 24 plus hours a week that I'm available to play. You can play me. Uh, it's easy if you want to play me once a week. It's easy to get a game when you have, uh, I'm available every day of the month. You can, you, you can find ways to get games with me. Okay, so you get a chance to play me as often as you as often as you can. I'm not going to turn you away. <clears throat> and then I'll rebroadcast uh, the game. I make I, I I make a video as I go. I rebroadcast it later. If I happen to, I might be playing two or three other people along with you. Uh, you know, I'll, have to, I'll be commenting all the games at once. But you'll get you know what's going in my mind when I'm thinking. You know, a lot of my you know a lot of my videos. My playlist, there's simultaneouses and one me playing live chess. You know, you, 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 I describe what I'm thinking uh, while I'm playing. So, uh, okay, so let me uh, make a little adjustment here. <clears throat>